Once that is understood, let's go on with the, a brief enlightening review of the basics of quantum mechanics before moving into our subject of discussing the real hydrogen atom. Well, as you know, the quantum theory, the first steps towards the development of a quantum mechanics or quantum theory of the nature is at the turn of the century paper of the Planck to address one of the puzzles people have come across to using the classical physics. And that was the black body radiation. I will list a few of them, although you know them so well, because we have to motivate ourselves. And what was the paradox? The paradox was uh, the, pres the paradigm of the day was Newton's, Newton's laws and Maxwell's laws. And a bit of, of course, thermodynamics, the second law and everything, that's there. Thermodynamics for the multiple, mul multi-particle systems. Newton's, particle, Newton's laws for the mechanical systems on the Earth and for the celestial systems, that work perfectly all right for the kind of motion that they had around it, right? What was the largest speed that one can think of? 50 kilometers, I guess, according to today's standards. Perhaps the 50 was the very upper limit of the, any kind of speed of the day. And when we came to the Maxwell's time, 1870s or something, and with the introductory help uh, and input coming from Faraday and all the other, these great people, Maxwell synthesized the electricity and magnetism, made a unified theory of electromagnetism. The basic entity is the light, which is a wave, Basic entity of the Newton's physics was the particles, geometrical particles essentially, and these two different sets were both explained by these two different sets of laws and it worked perfectly all right, very successful set of theories. But when people have penetrated at short distances and looked at this beautifully interesting phenomenon like black body radiation together with the laws of thermodynamics, there was a paradox. The paradox was that if you look at the energy density of a box filled of light and hot walls and everything so that there's hot radiation in it, and if you use these three sets of laws to compute the energy density as a function of frequency or wavelength opposite of each other, inverse of each other, and they have seen that there was a kind of behavior like t to the four the energy density increased by the fourth power of the temperature. So if the temperature goes high, very high, then of course it blows up and they haven't seen anything like that at the experiment. And what actually they have seen at the experiment was a very a smooth, beautiful dis distribution of the energy density with respect to the uh, temperature. And it wasn't blowing up like T to the four. And for different wavelengths and everything, it has a similar profile. I'm not, going, I'm not being very careful on this because this is old quantum theory. You know it since from several years in starting at the 300 course and everything. So to handle this paradox, Mr. Planck in, 19, in that very historical paper in 1900s, he proposed that incorrectly. The walls are composed of uh, uh, atoms who had discrete uh, frequency levels. You know, they actually the correct version is nowadays the radiation is composed of oscillators. Oscillators have discrete energy levels. Therefore, when you include, take this discreteness of the energy levels of the oscillators composing of the radiation, the profile you get is the experimental profile. Not that singularity that the energy blows up with the, with the increase of the temperature. The basic, the basic step in here is these discrete levels associated with the oscillators. 
But actually, when you look at it from in retrospective, from today's perspective, look at those things. What are those discrete levels? What are they associated with? What are those entities? Are there oscillators in the metal walls of the box or they are the oscillators? It's not clear. There are still some history of science papers written on it to, or trying to criticize from several perspectives. That's not our point. Our point is that there was a paradox one comes across to, by applying the beautifully correct classical laws for large distances and moderately low speeds known at the day of Galileo and Newton, you get a, a paradox. It doesn't work. It doesn't explain. They need new ingredients. One of the new ingredients was Planck's, although he didn't quite understand what he was talking about. There was a new ingredient, discreteness of the energies, which is quite foreign, quite alien to the people at the time. And then came that's another historical paper of Einstein, a paper which is by Einstein, and he was analyzing the black, no, so photoelectric effect, and through that analysis he has shown that photo light, which was known to be a wave-like entity, which could always beautifully describe by Maxwell's laws, also had a particle-like nature and the particle-like entities and attributes and wave-like attributes are proportional to each other with the constant introduced, proportionality constant being the one introduced by Planck. Particle-like entities in here, like energy momentum, wave-like entities in here, like frequency and wave, and these are associated, related to each other. So what was known to be a wave at the time of, since the time of Huygens at least, is now had a different character depending on the regime that it behaves like a particle. So this is sort of going back to the history. Newton had that idea. He thought that light was a stream of bullets, sort of bullets, or droplets of uh, water. So it's oscillating back and forth. Obviously, there must be something to it. Once it was thought by a great man like Newton to be particle-like, corpuscular, and Huygens a wave-like thing, and then comes again, the pendulum swings back, and Einstein and Planck thinks that it's particle-like. That was sort of a strong hint that this should have both behavior, both attributes, depending on the conditions. And then came this big gap, a huge gap of 20 years almost, with the e, contributions of great minds like Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, and Bohr. Perhaps to be fair, we have to include Mr. Bohr's, Henry Bohr's name in it, but his atom model is rather naive, really. So the quantum mechanics is the product of these, essentially these four great guys. And the synthesis was completed in 1926. Huge gap, right? Imagine, you are not pulling hat out of, pulling rabbit out of hat overnight. No overnight discoveries, even at the time, no overnight discoveries nowadays. You have to really work very hard. So some 20 years took it took these great minds even, and some secondaries, their students, associates, and hundreds of people, some 20 years to complete the synthesis. And we had non-relative to quantum mechanics completely formulated, and people turned their attention after, immediately afterwards to the relativistic version of that theory. But anyway, I will describe the basic and salient features of this theory as completed in 1926. It's an important thing. There is an important shift from the Newton plus Maxwell's paradigms to a new framework. Obviously, there are new elements. That is particle and wave duality. That same entities, both light had the particle-like character on, depending on regime. An electron, which was known to be a particle since its discovery in 1897 by J.J. Thompson, was shown to be have first postulated to have the wave-like behavior by de Broglie in 1927. In 1929 and 30, it was demonstrated experimentally that it indeed had wave-like nature. You know, one of the persons who have this, uh, demonstrated that electron is wave-like is the Thomson, the sun. 
So the father Thompson has discovered the JJ Thompson is discovered the particle E as a particle in 1897 and the G Thompson isn't that a great family discovered that E as a wave and of course this is proving the conjecture of de Broglie so we have to really give proper reference to de Broglie in here he proposed it in 1927 in his PhD thesis and it was demonstrated by this Thompson the son Thompson the father discovered the particle Thompson the son showed that it is uh, electron is a wave it behaves waves under certain circumstances very good. Then, of course, comes the relativization, and it was immediately done by Dirac in 1927, and, and all these features discovered by 28 and everything, and the antiparticle came in, and there was an open game, then the quantum field theory came in, etc. So what we have to now uh, is essentially, so 90, uh, Dirac's Original paper is, I guess, issued in 1927 and 26 and published in 27. But anyway, relativistic quantum mechanics is Dirac. And let me put the, t uh, the year, because these things are not overnight, you know. When you submit a paper, it's published after several months, etc. So, but the private, through the letters, the private discovery is known by all the leading figures in the market. So what we will cover in this class is, the, is this beautiful story. Taking it from, uh, taking everything from 1926, using that formalism for the first part of the course, and then Dirac and his followers afterwards in the 1927 thing. So, what is really the quantum theory, and what are the quantum paradigm essential features? If that old paradigm, which worked in, under special uh, conditions, perfectly all right, and it failed in explaining not only the black body radiation, but another important, uh, there is another historically important example which we have to talk about. It is the stability of the atoms. Atoms are, at the turn of the century, it was more or less known that although the, the idea goes back to the time of Democritus 2200 years ago, more modern version of the atomic thought, atomic model is just before the turn of the century due to Mr. Dalton. At, at the turn of the century, people really knew that there are basic entities. The very basic entities are atoms forming the matter. And eventually in 1909, 08 and 09, there was an important discovery of the actual structure of what the atom is like. That's this great figure is Rutherford, which is now one of the most important experimental physicists of the whole history. Rutherford has shown through scattering ex experiments, scattering is the basic tool, basic microscope for penetrating into the short distances. And he has shown that the atom is composed of a, a positive charge, which is concentrated in very short distances, 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. And there's an equal amount of negative charge distributed around it, but after a certain vacuum of five orders of magnitude. And electrons are circulating around the, the nucleus far, far, far away. To imagine the actual size of the atom, let's blow it up and let's go to a football stadium. If the circumference of the football stadium is sort of the regions that al along which the electrons are circulating, and the nucleus is a pinhole at the center of the football stadium, so five orders of magnitude, 100,000 times smaller than actual size. So if you really atoms are of the vacuums, nothingness, void. So we are really essentially composed of vacuum. There are uh, 
10 to the 26 atom per kilogram in the body. So what is the size of the uh, human body? 1.5 times 10, etc. So it is meter, uh, 30 liters, 40 liters, something like that, right? Volume. Fifty liters. Now, if you imagine that uh, there is this five orders of magnitudes uh, difference in size between the electrons and the nucleus. So, if you if there was no vacuum, although there are so many things in fifty kilograms uh, body, there is about ten to the twenty-seven atoms. So probably it will be as small as one centimeter cube or even less a fraction of a centimeter cube. A world of migots, right? If there was no vacuum, then we would be, the life, the entire uh, living entities would be like microbes, small entities. Huh? So physics is full of beautiful secrets. And this one of the beautiful secrets is the vacuum, uh, which is essentially composing all the atoms. The size is 10 to the five, minus 8 centimeter, but the a nucleus is concentrated on 10 to the minus 15 centimeter scale. Okay, so let's move on. Atoms are stable, we are stable, right? And our stability is essentially based on the stability of the proton. Neutron is not stable because atoms are formed of protons and neutrons and electrons, the first generation of the known fundamental particles essentially. The higher generations are not entering into the structure of the body or the structure of the matter known to us, which is actually paradoxically constitute 5% of the entire mass of the universe. So there are so many open problems for any of you if you enter into the field. The known matter, which is explained beautifully by the standard model, particularly after the discovery of the Higgs boson in 4th of July, so we have a very well understanding of the matter. There are six, three generations of quarks and leptons, but the known matter is formed of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are for, composed of the up quarks and down quarks, only in electrons. So only the first generation of the fundamental particles are taking place in the constitution of the known matter. Known matter, the visible matter as we know of, constitute about 5%, even less than that, of the, the entire mass of the universe. Here is a beautiful set of open problems. So any of you, any of you who find answers to these will obviously get a Nobel Prize, right? These are open problems, challenging problems. But anyway, let me proceed yet with the challenges that we have. Atoms are stable, but if I explain, try to explain the atoms in the context of this beautiful paradigm, which was valid till about 1900s, these were the only tools that we looked at the universe. This explains perfectly the, all the motion, mechanical motion on the Earth and the celestial motions, moon around the Earth, Earth around the sun, and all these things were beautifully explained. And this explained anything concerning the light with a uh, constant speed entering into it, which is beautiful. Eventually, she verified by the Michelson and Molle experiment that this is the speed of light, which is to be invariant. But now, if I apply this law to the uh, uh, atom, what do I get? Atom is composed of positive energy, positive charge nucleus, and negative, ch uh, negative charge electrons. Negative charge electrons are circulating according to these laws. It's not true anymore. They are circulating in trajectories, elliptical or circular, doesn't matter. They are accelerating because that's an accelerated motion. Accelerating and thus radiating energy. What is the energy radiated per unit time? Proportional to the square of the acceleration. That is the, according to Mr. Maxwell, if you compute the radiation energy, it's square of the acceleration. So what happens? It's a certain amount of energy to start with, suppose, then as it moves, it radiates energy and eventually it falls on the electron. So atom, atoms cannot be stable. 
It, they will collapse in the very small fraction of seconds, but they don't <laughs> really, and all the entire matter lives. They all live, nothing collapses, atoms are there to, to stay. Atoms are there uh, not to stay forever, obviously. We disintegrate when we die, but proton is there for 13 billion, seven years since the Big Bang. So when there was this poster that we are all 13.7 7, billion years old, that's correct really. All the protons in our body are coming from the Big Bang. Once it's created, it's there. There is nothing which can destroy it. But anyway, here's a paradox. According to the Mr. Newton and Maxwell, atoms are unstable. We know that they are not stable. Thus, that model cannot work under for these uh, atomic scales. The, the so-called micro world composed of atoms cannot be, couldn't have been explained. And the people developed new paradigm which could explain this. What are the essential features of the new paradigm? Essential feature of the new paradigm is that then state, concept of state changes. State concept changes. This is such a big dramatic change I have to explain it. From classical to quantum. Perhaps you are never used to it. Nobody talks about it. But there's a concept of state in classical physics. What is it? Well, classical physics is F equals MA, right? Anybody knows, even in primary school, perhaps not in primary school, but they know that there is an equation like that. There is an intrinsic quantity, second derivative of the position. And this is external, which is to be measured and provided so that you can solve this equation. So it is, well, this is a vector equation or for each degree of freedom, there is one equation. So there are three equations for a single entity. If there are n degrees of freedom, there are n equations. But beyond that, this is a second degree equation in time. Being second degree in time means if you would like, like to write a general solution, it should involve two constants. What are those constants? They are those constants are the initial values of the position, which is entering in here, and its first derivative. That's the theory of differential equations, right? If you know this two initial conditions for each degree of freedom, then you can predict the values of those pairs for any time. Pick, thus, do I have a definition of the state hidden in here? Yes. The definition of the state then is the following. If I know xi, pi pairs for all i, then I know the state of the system. That is, I can answer any question about the physical state of the system. That's the state. But that means measurement. In order to know these, for each degree of freedom, I need to measure them. Physics is a, a phenomenological science. It's not a mathematics. Mathematics is a powerful tool that you are using, but it's a phenomenological science. You measure them and that gives you the information, then you can answer all the questions. And this equation tells you that once I know them at a given time, then I know the values of them at any time. So that's deterministic. That's a deterministic theory. Determinism is an important concept, and it's being used in many different contexts, even in the theology. People are discussing the free will, right? Iradi, juzi, iradi, kuldi. Free will problem is also in it. But classical mechanics is deterministic. Being deterministic, it clashed for many centuries. That's the reason why Mr. Galileo was in trouble, right? He was uh, punished by the ch church. And determinism clashes with the religion, with the, with the theology. It's causal because once you know the initial values, you can predict the future value. So you have a beautiful theory, deterministic and causal. And state is composed by the knowledge of any uh, position and momenta for any degrees of freedom, etc. And uh, this equation, together with these inputs, you have a beautiful theory. But we know that it doesn't work. We have to shift, change this, modify this. 
So what is the state? Obviously, state cannot contain both this and that. It must be half of the information. Why is that so? Well, we said we have to measure these things. These things are uh, obviously at the micro universe. These are the position and momenta of, of the electron or proton. And these things are very light. And the mass of the, uh, those entities are at the order of 10 to the minus 27 and 10 to the minus 29 kilograms, right? So you are talking about very, very, very light entities. If there are the, these are the mass, you have to be careful in me measuring them. Obviously, you cannot rule ruler or scale or the clock to measure the things which is happening in those regions. You have to have different techniques to measure the masses and the length sizes and the times associated with the atomic world. So people developed first the thought experiments or Gedanken experiments to really address those things. What is the most famous Gedanken experiment concerning the measurement issue. One Gedanken experiment is the Heisenberg microscope. It's a beautiful idea. Heisenberg's microscope. Indeed, all these things are microscopes, right? Even the LHC is a microscope, sort of, to look into that indirectly. Such a short distance, 10 to the minus 20 centimeters. I mean, even 10 to the minus 25 centimeters. The idea is the following. This is a thought experiment. Gedanken in German means thought. Here is, say, an entity, a microbe or whatever, an atom or electron. You would like to uh, sort of measure its momentum, right? So you send light in it. it scatters of course the electron is ejected because these are small entities we know that light also has quantum like due to mr einstein it has particle like a property and actually what is the underlying phenomenon in here the so called compton effect what is the compton effect here is an electron here is a photon here is such a scattering right so it is like two electron or two electron or positron, electron or proton. Photon and electron is scattered and comes out a photon and electron. Of course, its energy will change, thus the frequency will change, etc. You can relate the difference in the wavelength of the initial and final photon comes up with the so-called Compton wavelength. Beautiful concept of it. So Mr. Heisenberg is using that Compton phenomenon sort of to mimic what's going on in the measurement. So you, if you are trying to m measure the momentum, you send a light in it, and light scatters. It go, you catch the one which is going through the microscope, comes to your eye or your detector, and the electron is eject, it's pushed around, it's moved. That's the point. So if I repeat this experiment, the, the first for measuring the position and then the momentum, or first change the order, momentum and the position. Once I send the probe light to see what's going on for measuring the position. The momentum is different than what it was before because it is pushed away from its trajectory or vice versa. So this shows that the measurement is an order dependent process. Measurement is order dependent. That is, measuring xi pj or pi xj, you get different results in that order. Aha, uh -huh, they say, these in the 20 years time. Well, these dynamical variables that we, are, we, are, we know of from the classical theory, which enters into the definition of Newton's laws and Maxwell's laws, that is the position, momentum, angular momentum, energy, they cannot be ordinary C numbers. Dynamical variables, well, as I said, the most famous one of them is X and P. Dynamical variables cannot be C numbers. That is pure numbers. C number is pure number. 
they must be of different nature, of the nature that their order is important. What are the mathematical entities, you know, that which depends on the order? Matrices, for instance, right? You know that if you multiply two matrix in a given order, A, B, and then B, A, you get different result. Aha, uh -huh, they say. Then these dynamical variables perhaps should be represented not by the numbers, but by entities like matrices, operators. Beautiful. You say how physical the argument is behind. It's not a mathematical uh, framework, pure mathematical framework, because this is physics. But are, are, could they be any operators? Of course not. Because people know, the mathematicians knew quite well, that there is a specific class of operators which are Hermitian class. They are the natural candidates to be associated with the dynamical variables. Why? Because Hermitian operators are known to have real eigenvalues. And the eigenfunctions associated with different eigenvalues are orthogonal. There's a beautiful mathematical theorem. I'm sure any of you can prove that on your own. So Hermitian operators are just the right thing that we know, we require because, well the answer is again difficult. Why we need that? Hermitian operators are known then you say, is this the way that we can associate this new operators and the classical C numbers? Because if the theory we are constructing is consistent, so when we go to the classical limit, they should reproduce the classical laws. You should agree with the Newtons and Maxwell. We are not totally different because these work in certain regimes. So my new theory, if I carry it to the regime in which these laws are successful, we should reproduce the same results. How do we do that? We say, a new, another step, the classical quantities correspond to the expectation values of the new operators we introduce. Expectation values come into the game. So let me write them down. So operators are introduced. Operators Expectation values, this is associated with the dynamical variables. Expectation values of operators should be, should correspond. That's the correspondence principle. Shows correspond to these dynamical variables. Expectation values are eigenvalues, right, for operators. If you work out the mathematics, thus they are indeed real, so that's good. Why good? Because if I choose the operators to be Hermitian, I know that their eigenvalues are already real, so operators are Hermitian. So that finishes the operator side. R to B Hermitian. Beautiful. Experiment told us that they must be order dependent entities. We said the good candidates are operators. They must be Hermitian because only Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues. By the way, some of you perhaps know the literature. There is a recent research field working with the non-Hermitian Hamiltonians. And they're saying that there are certain limited regions of the spectrum in which, despite the fact that Hamiltonians are non-Hermitian, you may have real eigenvalues. But anyway, that's beyond the level of this level of a class. We will focus on the Hermitian Hamiltonians only. So, what about the state? People carried out different experiments because there were experiments, diffraction experiments, slit experiments to demonstrate that particles behave like waves. And through the experiments, people see that there is a statistical nature, statisticity 
the, as different than the ordinary particle-like trajectories following a certain uh, path. And they have uh, said that if you would like to have a statistical behavior of the objects going through certain slits, then perhaps uh, we have to have the wave nature of these particles should be more prominent, should enter into the equation. Because Einstein and de Broglie completed the picture. Particles behave like waves, waves behave like particles, so there is no difference between the particles and waves. It's only the regime in which you are looking at, the probing the system. So this is the operator aspect and state aspect. They say instead of using these pairs for describing a state for all degrees of freedom, you have to go to another concept. The state is represented by a wave function, psi of xt, based on all these accumulated information, based on double slit experiments, etc., mostly optical type of research. 25 years it took people to get to this point. Remember, so if it was overnight, you would have said that some kind of telephone call. It's not like that. People work and work and work. Hundreds of people work and they come up with the synthesis. Born, Max Born was very instrumental in coming up with this interpretation. Now Born rule. So Mr. Born said that psi is such that if you know that the psi of xt squared mod squared, which is a positive definite quantity, gives you the probability of finding the object in a unit volume at x, centered at x, at time t. Probability density. If it is probability density, if it is the physical meaning you attribute to this mathematical quantity, you have to first of all tell us how this function evolves in time, because time evolution is an important problem. It is the one associated with the Newtonian motion along a trajectory. Newtonian motion along a trajectory and time evolution in quantum theory are the same things. So they have also deduced that this satisfies an equation which is similar to a wave equation, but not a wave equation, because if you write this explicitly for a specific velocity non-independent potentials, it has that form. Notice that when you have the Laplacian square acting on psi, it already mimics that it's like a wave equation if it was d squared by dt squared, but it's not. So that Schrodinger equation, although it mimics a wave equation, it's not a wave equation. It's a different equation. It's a beautifully different equation. Um, because these are not physical waves, and as Mr. Born again has emphasized, these are not matter waves or physical waves, they are probability waves. Think of it, it's a beautif beautiful and radically different idea. Because originally Mr. Schrodinger has also thought that this could be a charge density or matter density wave. Well, of course, the, the most well-known counterexample is the neutrino. It doesn't have charge, it doesn't have mass, but it's quantum mechanical. So there are entities, there are animals in the universe which do not carry charge or uh, mass, or both or either or. They are still, they exist. Therefore, this quantity, obviously, we are in a better position than Mr. Schrodinger and his friends. This cannot be associated with any physical entity. It's a probability wave. And the probability, once you say probability, you have to resort to the a beautiful subject of mathematics. It's the probability theory. In the probability theory, there are two postulates. Probabilities are non-negative. Suppose you have a family of getting the results of an experiment, each labeled by an index R. And the sum of all these options should add up to one. That is, you have a dice, you throw a dice, there are six faces, and so the outcome of any throw is one of the faces, one to six. So the probability of getting one of the faces is one over six. This, uh, this sum is one, what is the meaning of sum? You get one of the faces where you throw, it cannot s s s stay on its tip. Either one face will come out. 
So the sum of all the options should be equal to one. That's an important mathematical input into this physical theory. If this is the probability density, then what is the corresponding one to this? Well, by the way, this condition is not automatically satisfied because we take the psi mod squared. It's a complex function squared. Mod squared is a positive definite quantity, obviously. Therefore, the first postulate is automatically satisfied for consistency reason. If I call it probability, it should obey the basic postulates of the probability, obviously. A second, we have to sum, but this is a continuous system labeled by a continuous label. Therefore, its sum is an integral, d cube x, psi of x, t squared is 1. Good. So that is more or less a complete picture, right? We have the dynamical variables represented by operators, Hermitian operators. We have a state which is a wave function, wave-like function, satisfying a certain equation, which is called the Schrodinger equation. So the time evolution is known. If I know the value of psi at a given time, I can predict the value of it at any future time, at any time. So it's causal. So causality is retained. When you go from Newtonian or classical physics to quantum, the causality is retained. Although there are some misunderstandings in the literature when you read certain books, it's, they, they confuse the determinism and causality. It's not. Causality is that once you have the central object given at a certain time, and you can predict its value at any time. So Schrodinger equation is causal. That is, psi x zero is known. can predict from this equation psi of x t. Fine. You, so you can predict it. But determinism is softened. Determinism there was in the classical physics in terms of the labels for the state x and p, you can answer all the physical questions about the system if you know xp pair for any degree of freedom. You can answer any question about the physical system. That you can, nothing to do with the causality or prediction of the future. But what is the physical state? X, i, p, x i p i is replaced by psi of x t. Notice that beautifully it is half of the variables, not the full. Or you can go to the Fourier transform space. You can have the physical state described by the phi of p t. Either psi of x t or phi of p t, but not x and p. Some of you who have who has done a bit of research in the literature, you may notice that there is a distribution called Wigner distribution, W, which depends on X and P. Think of this W, X, P, Wigner distribution in terms of this veto. You have to have half of the variables, either X or P, not both, representing a state. This is a state function, so it is labeled by X or P, either or. These are Fourier transforms to each other. But do I, if I know this, can I answer all the questions about the physical system precisely, exactly, certainly? No. I can only answer in the probabilistic sense. I say my object is somewhere in that uh, small volume, unit volume there with the probability psi of xt squared. So the expectation value of the observables will be also that imprecise related to the probability. So it's probabilistic determinism, not deterministic anymore. It is probabilistically deterministic. I emphasize this because this is really so important 
if you are not going to do any research in quantum mechanics, but if, as you are a physicist, you should know the basic property of the quantum mechanics properly. It is causal but not deterministic. It's probabilistically deterministic. Therefore, theologists, church, thought that physics and church now comes in full agreement. No fight anymore. Because it's not fully deterministic, it's probabilistically. God creates the human being, initial condition is given. So all the future actions are God's fault, right? If I do something bad, it's fault. Because he gave me the initial condition, I, I am bound to reach to that point. That's what Mr. Newton said. But in quantum theory, there is a certain probability that I can go there or there. I can do good, I can do bad. So it's not God's fault. Church was very happy. They said quantum theory saved the Christianity, saved the Bible. I'm not of that opinion, of course, but still, that's why I'm telling you what's going on, what's happening. 